the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So annual, annual parish meeting Sunday means that this moment is one, one part homily, one, one part retrospective, one part looking forward. Highlights, many details perhaps omitted, but ones you could glean from the printed annual report at a later time today or later this week. You know you, you can see, you can recognize the unfolding kingdom of God before you when? How do you answer that question? You know you can see, you can recognize the unfolding kingdom of God before you when? Are, are, are there metrics one can use for that discernment? Uh, is it something you can describe in the language of this realm? For, for whom is the discernment reserved? For theologians, for educated, the, the, the faithful, however defined, for artists, musicians? Is it, is it something you feel? You can recognize the unfolding kingdom of God before you when? Renewal movements within Christianity, age over age, have prescribed conditions for faithful discernment and recognition. The catechumenal process of the ancient church sought to inspire a faithful approach to Christian initiation and living. The canonization of a saint required the imprimatur of church and sometimes church-wide panels, both formal and informal. Ignatius of Loyola, introduced habits for the Christian whereby the will of God might be known and realized for the individual. Baptism and confirmation were not sufficient for the charismatic who, who might also require added signs of the Holy Spirit at work in the life of the true believer. In the United States, the 20th century seemed especially rampant with Christian sects requiring this sign of faith or that. For more on this, see Flannery O'Connor. <laughs> Today it's not uncommon for the unfolding kingdom of God to be identified with that place or that time where love can be found. Find love and you've found the kingdom. Or where self-sacrifice can be found. Find the evidence of self-sacrifice and you've found the unfolding kingdom or where mercy abounds or where the poor reside. No, no need to quibble with any of these except possibly those who suffer under the sharp critique of Flannery. But I believe that the scripture lessons of the last two weeks give us an even broader, perhaps clearer context by which the kingdom might be recognized. The kingdom of God may be found there where the expectations and customs of this world are being turned upside down, where the extraordinary has become commonplace and where the hint of a restored Eden is disrupting the order of the fall. How do those first around the adult Jesus come to identify him with the unfolding kingdom? Well, they answer his invitation to come and see. H how do those fishermen who, who first encounter and recognize the Messiah on the docks of their life know they've come upon the unfolding kingdom of God? Well, they leave their nets. They leave everything that's familiar. Actually, they leave their livelihood behind and follow him. Fishing wasn't a pastime for those who could tie the most spectacular lure. First century AD fishing wasn't what you did on your weekend off each month. It was a matter of necessity, a, a hook or net to table enterprise without which the household would go hungry. It is unlikely. It is improbable. It's foolhardy. But they leave their nets behind for the Messiah, for Jesus, for the promised unfolding kingdom of God. 
If nothing else, I think we can measure how attuned we are to this unfolding kingdom by how upside down and unlikely the course of events are proving to be. I so hope that's a guiding principle for you in your Christian walk. I so hope that is a guiding principle for us in our ministry together here at Christ Church. So a few quick improbable highlights. Again, as I mentioned, for a more fulsome report, see, see a copy, the hard copy of the, the 2020 annual report. Evangelism. In the past year, we know that as far as the culture is concerned, the church at large is shrinking. You can't pick up a newspaper and not see some story that notes the diminishing size and influence of the church. Churches in Nashville, too, are shrinking. But Christ Church continues to thrive against the grain. Greeters, newcomer ministries, general efforts at evangelism, the hard path of journey and faith collectively bear out the strange undoing of cultural headlines that have prematurely predicted the doom of the church. We have the good news of Jesus Christ to tell, and there are so many eager for its telling. Matthew, Josh, Rich, Andrea Tucker, French, Ball, and others have worked hard to see our welcome multiply for the sake of the kingdom. Outreach. In the past year, nonprofit after nonprofit in Davidson County has struggled in ministry to find volunteers and to make budget. And yet Christ Church was able to give away our prompt charitable giving in excess of $500,000. Seasonal offerings, grant committee tithe distributions, Ms. Chief's Penny Drive, the 100 winter coats collected and, and distributed, the $150,000 raised by Dave Pomeroy and Nashville Unlimited during the 20th century, excuse me, 20th anniversary shows this year. O over the last two years, I've often said that Christ Church gives away approximately $2 million in ministry aid and sponsorship every 10 years based on an average of $200,000 a year. But this year, that number more than doubled for us. Use of the Opportunity Fund to grant front grants for school building in Haiti and for the purchase of the Family Reconciliation House demonstrated the wisdom of past vestries in working to right-size the use of annual interest distributions from the endowment. The burrito bicycle ministry taken up by our youth. The expansion of our room in the inn ministry to include nights for women. New initiatives in migration and refugee ministry and further attempts to build up the rideshare work of the cathedral. These are signs of a community with a big heart an oversized desire to serve, and a foolhardy lack of concern for institutional stability. That seems gospel steady to me. That seems of God. That seems precisely right because it runs against the expectations of this world. A special thanks to Roger Satterstrom, Joe Altman, Gina Williams, Anna Rodriguez Massey, and David Morton for their tireless work with many others, holding up the face of Christ in the other. Christian formation, from our nursery to catechesis of the Good Shepherd, to teenage youth spiritual formation, to the work of adult spiritual formation. Together, we've nearly doubled the parish-wide Sunday morning participation in Sunday school hour when compared to participation about 10 years ago. Nashville hosted an international conference on the work of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd in the past year. Our own catechists have worked to broaden a program, at first specifically Roman Catholic in orientation, to a reformed curriculum that now takes the Book of Common Prayer principles into account. Special events like Discovery Weekend, we just, we just had that. They're forcing, I think, a reevaluation of expectation for how teenagers engage in the life of the church. Allison and Hannah, together with parents, a youth advisory council, and volunteers have rebuilt a Christ Church youth program into one where youth from other churches are wanting to jump in with us. Huge props to all involved here. Special offerings like the Advent and Lent podcast series that Matthew Lewis and our diocesan colleague put together this last year. They, they've developed audiences across the diocese, indeed across the United States, 
offering them and a wider audience in the parish the opportunity to benefit from this Christ Church spiritual formation offering. I'm grateful to him for the work he has put in on these efforts. The Ministry of Pastoral Care. An unusual number of deaths, especially towards the end of this past year, forced Christ Church to grieve with families experiencing loss. Somehow, as we walked through those days, it presented an unusual challenge for us, learning to grieve at the end of the year while seeking the joy of the holiday season, learning to mourn and yet without sackcloth, learning to hold both the nativity and the resurrection in our hands at the same time. It was an improbable challenge for us that Lisa, the, the Christ Church Associate for Pastoral Care, Lisa, no part of our life was untouched by her work and by these deaths. It's left holes in our hearts, holes in the ranks of our volunteers, and gaps in the tithes and offerings that support our work, and yet we've carried on, cherishing their memory, working to raise up leadership after them, and picking up the financial responsibility that they had borne. I'm grateful to Lissa and the many volunteers that have worked to coordinate the pastoral care ministry of the cathedral. The capital campaign. The success of this year's capital campaign must, must be counted among the evidence for the unlikely. Many said that now was not a good time for a capital campaign. Others said not for Christ Church anyhow. The professionals suggested that if we started down this path for the sake of a new parish hall, for renewed space for outreach ministry and formation and youth ministry, then the best we could expect to raise would be around $6 million. As of last Friday, we are brushing right up against $9 million. You've worked hard to raise that as an investment in the future of this unlikely and foolish enterprise we call ministry at Christ Church. Many thanks to Hal and Donna Johnson, Ellen Coleman, Charlie and Mary Cook, and the dozens of other volunteers who worked tirelessly for this campaign, and the hundreds of households who pledged and are giving. The result is unlikely, but it means all the more of God. The building committee from whom we'll hear more later this morning, full firm EOA, and with ministry representatives from within the parish, and with the vestry, presenting drawings to Sunday morning workshops, getting parish feedback, spending time with individuals who had specific ideas about where the project should go, and costing out the project at every proposed iteration. The building committee has made a recommendation to the vestry, and you will see the fruit of their work in just a bit. Preliminary price tags, inclusive of deferred maintenance, uh, showed an initial pricing at 21 million. And then after cost cutting, 19, and after further cost cutting and downsizing, about 18. Would still broadly seem to be beyond our reach. We've worked hard and come a long way, but there is some more work to do here. The Finance Committee believes that the capital campaign funds raised augmented by a portion of the income stream from Lot C development to address deferred maintenance might allow us to afford as much as a $17.5 million renovation building project? If yes, it would still leave about a $2 million plus gap. The building committee will continue its work to cut costs, and the capital campaign leadership is likely going to need to raise a bit more funds in order for the project to proceed. This is today's challenge, and there could be no better time, I think, for this to come before us. It's the day today for us to forge ahead, however unlikely, and complete this work for the Christ Church of today and for the Christ Church of tomorrow. Lot C development. We're about four months away now from the anticipated shovel in the ground for its development. When the construction of the hotel tower begins, we will lose our surface parking there on Lot C for approximately two years, the length of time required to complete the building project. We'll need to draw on all of the work we've done together to reorient our commuting habits on Sunday morning. Starting in late April, early May, plan to carpool with friends. Seek out a parking space maybe just a few extra minutes away from the front door of the cathedral. 
plan to worship at other times, maybe breaking bread on a Sunday. You can count on the church office's work to continue to identify additional parking spaces and to manage the ones that remain in use with greater efficiency. We are likely in the fall to move Sunday morning liturgies, the later liturgy, to 1115 so as to allow additional time for Sunday school participants to clear out before the 1115 congregation begins to arrive. We are likely to have bus passes available for those who would take the bus and will encourage everyone who lives downtown to walk to church on good weather days. This challenge, I think, is going to be akin to the season of life at Christ Church when we renovated this nave. Many said then that attendance would drop, but as the stories are told and remembered, the challenge and excitement of that time and of that renovation moved many to connect afresh with their church. The unexpected in our, in our annual financial support and program, in a year when we gave or facilitated over a half million dollars for outreach, in a year where the parish raised almost nine million dollars for the capital campaign, you will see shortly in the financial report that we landed slightly in the red for the 2019 annual budget. At the end of the pledge drive for 2020, we were short of our goal. However, when we let the parish know by way of announcement, about three dozen households stepped up to pledge, some for the first time and some to increase their pledge for 2020. And that response pulled us ahead of last year's total and made it possible for us to increase the hours that the nave will be open starting in March. It made it possible for us to give more musician and clergy attention to the growing breaking bread at six hour of worship and to provide the staff with a cost of living increase. We advanced against expectations and against what was probable. This challenge to model expectant work and to embody faithful waiting for the coming kingdom will be especially acute in the next several years. When given the chance, I encourage you to walk the extra mile, to offer the other cheek, and to expect the unexpected. About 10 days ago, Darlene and I returned from Rome where I had had the opportunity to preach in the chapel of St. Augustine at the Anglican Center in Rome. It's a kind of worldwide Anglican embassy to Vatican City. It was a thrill and a privilege. It also coincided with the Darlene's and mine 38th wedding anniversary. After the midday Eucharist and preachment at the center, there was lunch, and then after lunch we decided to walk and sightsee just a bit, maybe with a sense of obligation. We were here and needed to do that. My focus had been on the center, and yet there were things one should see and do before leaving Rome. That afternoon we walked about an hour over to the Sistine Chapel and waited our turn. And soon after arriving, we found ourselves walking down the ramp and suddenly, as if carried by the wind, on into the chapel. Amazing in every way. Colors and light and brilliance and breath. We held hands and, and sat on the perimeter in wonder. I hadn't really even known to want to be there. I, I didn't know what I would have missed had I not gone. We just sat in wonder. And then, quite suddenly, a young man, a priest from Africa, in his 20s, stepped to the microphone and greeted the hundred or so people in the chapel. This is a holy place, he said. Please, no photographs. Treat this chapel and one another with respect. I imagine, I imagine this was something that was said on the hour throughout the day. But then the priest said, if anyone wishes a blessing or wishes to make a confession, I'll be standing over here by the door. Please join me there. Now, there was no mad rush. <laughs> a few people started to form a line. But I grabbed Darlene's hand and I said, come on, let's go get our anniversary blessing." And again, I, I didn't even know what I was asking. I was sort of caught up in the moment. I didn't even know what to expect. But when we finally made our way into his presence, the young priest took his time with us. Where are you from? Do, do you have children? Do you have grandchildren? 
And then he spied, he spied my open collar, black shirt, no collar. I'd taken it off to go into the Sistine Chapel. But he said, are you a priest? And I nodded, and he said, what kind? I said, an Episcopal priest, a, an Anglican, part of the Anglican communion. And then right off the bat, he turned to Darlene and said, thank you for your sacrifice. <laughs> Thank you for all you've given the church in the work of your family. And then finally he prayed the most personal and uplifting prayer over the two of us, commending us to God, praying for the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. I didn't, I didn't even know to want this, but it was for me the high point of our travels. I couldn't see around the corner. But God came to us in the unexpected and blessed us that day and for the future. I'm so grateful for Darlene and Hannah and all of my growing family who, who so willingly and eagerly embraced the service of Christ Church. We've begun our 11th year in ministry with you and still do not even know what to want or expect other than the unexpected. We love this work. We, we love you. And together with you, find loving the Lord our greatest joy. Surely the call to discipleship requires having ears that, ears that hear and eyes that see. Surely the call to discipleship asks us to follow Jesus by the breadcrumbs left behind, the scraps that, that ask you and me to forsake the standards and expectations of this world for the unexpected and wildly unlikely signs of what will be. In the coming year, when you pray to know the will of God for your life, ask for the unexpected. Ask for the hard path. Ask to be led through the door and to the corner around which you cannot see. Ask for the place at the end of the line, amongst the children, far from the seat of power and among the imprisoned. It may not be clear what life there will look like. You may have no idea how those days will unfold. The fruit borne by the answer to such a prayer is unlikely to be the fruit that your blood relatives have hoped would be produced by your life. It will, however, have taken you deep into the heart of your Savior, deep into the soul of a kingdom-bearing life, and deep into the mystery of God's plan for salvation. Bernard of Clairvaux championed a definition of the kingdom of God that declared it to be foreign and different from anything we could want or desire or know to ask for. Many centuries later, W.H. Auden would distill Bernard's imagination into a few lines in his poem, For the Time Being, just a brief verse. He is the way. Follow him through the land of unlikeness. You will see rare beasts and have unique adventures. He is the truth. Seek him in the kingdom of anxiety and you will come to a great city that has expected your return for years. He is the life. Love him in the world of the flesh and at your marriage, all its occasions will dance for joy. The kingdom of God may be found there where the expectations and customs of this world are being turned upside down, where the extraordinaries become commonplace and where the hint of a restored Eden is disrupting the order of the fall. You know you can see, you can recognize the unfolding kingdom of God when you have followed him into the land of unlikeness. Amen.